In a world where the 3DS online services are shutting down, the people are fearful for the future of Pokemon transfers through Pokemon Bank. A shutdown of this service would render certain shiny Pokemon completely unobtainable outside of special events. And the fate of these Pokemon rests in one other Pokemon's hands. And his name is question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. That's right, we're back, baby. If Pokemon Bank is at risk of shutting down someday, then I'm gonna make sure to get some of the shinies that are only possible to get in the older games, outside of special events or Pokemon Go. Because unless you want to give me a time machine, I can't get those right now. But shiny Jirachi is in Pokemon Go. Not right now it's not, so I don't want to see a single comment about it. Plus, this is what Pokemon Go would look like for me right now. Anyway, today we'll be exploring Pokemon Emerald to see how many shiny legendaries and mythical we can end up getting here, using any means possible to catch each new legendary listing in the Pokedex. There are a few shiny legendaries that we can pretty much only get here, but in order to do that, we're gonna have to start a new game. Wait, why are we playing in Japanese? Well, there's one particular Pokemon that's only going to be fully legal if we do it in Japanese Emerald. And, uh... It's Mew again. Let's further clarify, going back to the last video on this. In Gens 1 and 2, shininess is determined by the DVs of the Pokemon, and the Mew that was distributed for the Virtual Console release didn't have a possible DV spread that allowed it to be shiny when it was transferred into the newer games. So while the 8F Mew is legit enough for Pokemon Home, it's technically still not legit, and Game Freak could, if they wanted to, make such a Mew be flagged as illegal. However, there was an event only for Japanese Emerald that allowed you to encounter a Mew with your OT on your save file. And Shiny Locks in-game didn't really exist until Generation 5, and this event was coded into the game. And even with all of the other generations, this remains the only way to get a Shiny Huntable Mew. So, how do we get it? Well, this goes all the way back to the beginning, as a major staple here in Generation 3 is going to involve us setting up for RNG manipulation. And fair warning, it's a little bit complicated. Are you ready? Set. Go. From the moment the game initially boots up, it'll start advancing the PRNG state. PRNG stands for Pseudo Random Number Generator, and is how many games simulate randomness. However, it's only the illusion of randomness. You give it an input value, the initial seed, which goes through a function, resulting in an output value, which then becomes the next input value. So if something crazy were to happen, like... I don't know, having the same initial seed every time, then your RNG would be the same every time you boot up the game. But that would be crazy, right? Oh hey, Pokemon Emerald has a bug that causes the initial seed value to always be zero. So we actually know what the RNG state will be at any given point in time. And since we know the RNG state, we'll know everything about a Pokemon that gets generated at any given point, including its PID number. And if this number matches with our trainer ID and secret ID numbers just right, it will cause a Pokemon to be shiny. Oh, and wouldn't you know it, these RNG states also determine those numbers at the start of the game. So depending on what frames we press A on, both to confirm our name and to clear the last text box from Professor Birch will be assigned our trainer ID as well as our hidden secret ID. Through normal gameplay, we wouldn't be able to figure out our secret ID number. However, if we know roughly how long it took us between those two A presses, maybe even down to a particular region of frames where it happened, then we can figure it out. And we do this by strategically soft resetting for a shiny starter. Using the program Pokefinder, we look for what would be a shiny frame with a particular SID. And if we're able to generate our starter on that frame and it turns up shiny, then we'll know our secret ID. But if this frame doesn't give us a shiny, then we continue to try other nearby secret ID numbers until it is shiny. If you want a full in-depth video guide on this process, check out this one from I'm a Blissey. Link in the description. There are several videos from him and Papa Hefe that go over things like this in Generation 3, and I wouldn't have been able to make this video without their guidance. So make sure you go subscribe to them, and make sure you're subscribed to me as well. Guys, we're so close to that haha -ha funny number. You might think you're subscribed and you're not actually subscribed, so just double check. And if you just hit that sub button, maybe we'll make it there before the make-believe date of February 29th. And you liking this video tells YouTube to show it to more people, meaning that we'll hit the haha -ha funny number even faster. But once again, Blissey and Hefe's videos were invaluable to making this video. Especially because before this, I never RNG manipulated anything in this game or performed any glitches in Gen 3. And we're going to be doing quite a few of those. Fun fact. 
fact, the only Gen 3 shiny that I ever found was a Zubat in a ROM hack that I made where everything was a Zubat, and I was just making the game as annoying as possible to play. Maybe I'll remaster that video at some point, because it was hot garbage. That one shiny Zubat is with over 500 hours logged in my childhood save files, and probably just as much on ROM hacks. And the only RNG manipulation I had done before was for the shiny Giratina in BDSP. And there's one major thing that I just wasn't quite ready for with Gen 3. Getting the shiny is genuinely difficult. The GBA games run at 60 frames per second, which while being the absolute minimum desired target for most modern games to hit, it makes inputs that have to be frame perfect remarkably difficult, because it makes a frame less than two hundredths of a second or about this long. So between this and having multiple secret ID numbers to check our shiny frame for, it might not surprise you that it took me around seven hours to find a shiny starter. Whoever that was, thank you for the follow. <laughs> Offline right now. Yes, it's it, let's go. Yo, lucky follow. <laughs> Though part of the reason it took me so long was my original trainer ID led to some insanely long wait times for the first shiny frame on certain secret IDs. We're talking like 60,000 plus advances for the first one, which would be nearly 17 minutes, and such a long wait time I felt wasn't even worth checking because you're more than likely not going to hit your frame on the first try, so that's a 17 minute wait multiple times, so rather than endure that I checked all the reasonable wait time secret IDs and they all failed. So I just restarted the process with a new trainer ID finally getting my shiny Trico. Meet Klutz. Why Klutz? I, I don't know, it, it's five characters long and sounded good, because you only have five characters to work with in Japanese. Our first shiny frame here is at 15488 advances, or having to wait 4.3 minutes. While it's still not perfect, it's at least doable. And the stats were pretty good for having to put up with such a wait, so I rolled with it. And now that we've done that, we have to beat the game. And just like that, we've beaten the game! I went stomping around on everyone in the Hoenn region with my red-tailed gecko. And I mean everyone. I battled every trainer and even a good few wild Pokemon, and had a Sceptile before the third gym. And after the fourth gym, I realized I was gonna need another HM user other than the typical Zigzagoon. But you know, I was, I was kinda craving another shiny Pokemon. And thankfully in Pokemon Emerald, for some reason Meryl on this route is at 25% encounter rate. Not that the encounter rate even really matters here though, your frame RNG also determines your wild Pokemon. And it just so happened that I had a shiny Meryl on the second shiny frame for this character, which unfortunately was about 25,000 frames into the game. I got kind of unlucky here in this regard. While the number of frames away is pretty reasonable at the 1 in 81.92 shiny odds, not only did I not get a particularly early shiny frame, but I didn't get the repeat frame phenomenon early either. There's some kind of quirk with the RNG that can make multiple nearby frames the same PID, meaning there can be multiple nearby shiny frames. But the first time that happened for this particular combo was 65,000 frames away. But not to worry, I got my shiny Meryl on the second try. Such a fwend. And I realized I also needed a flying Pokemon, so I would grab myself a shiny Talo over by Rustboro. That's definitely a Borb, right? I would continue to ride through the game on the back of Klutz. I paused for a little bit trying to get a shiny cast form, but I would end up accidentally getting a 3 IV one instead, so I called it good enough. I would give Fwend the experience share at some point, and Fwend would actually end up hard carrying on a couple of key fights. Go Fwend! Yes, Fwend! <laughs> Wait, that's actually kind of scary. Hit it! Hit it, Fwend! Hit friend. Oh. And by the time I reached the Elite Four, Fwend was able to contribute meaningfully there too. There were some bumps involved, but I'm using items here, so it's pretty much a guaranteed victory. And after engaging in some quick battle tower duplication shenanigans, I would be faced with my first legendary. Rayquaza, which for the people who watched me struggle for like 20 minutes that one time to get up Sky Pillar when I was hunting it normally, I will have you know that I did it on the first try this time. For this video we aren't going to care about getting 6 IV shiny legendaries, just getting the shiny. And it is here that I will respond to one of the more common questions that was raised by those who watched the last video. Why not just cheat? Why not just use an action replay to get them? Why not just use PK Hex? Well, primary reason number one, 
That's lame. I can't make a YouTube video out of that. Reason number two is I had never used PK Hex, period. I'm not very into the competitive Pokemon scene, and because of that, I never downloaded it. Until this video, and we'll explore why I downloaded it for this video later. But I kinda question why the concept of me having fun doing this stuff is being challenged. Isn't it cool that you can get all these shiny legendaries relatively easily without having to cheat? I definitely didn't need PK Hex for this shiny Rayquaza, it only took 4 resets to get, which took 20 minutes. I maybe would have wanted it for Groudon, who took 15 resets, taking an hour and a half to get. Part of this struggle was just because I had to walk forward rather than pressing A. Not a big difference functionally, but a huge difference mentally. Though I would catch it in the second ball I threw, nice to get that color match. But a large part of the fun in going through the games like this is that these games were a part of my childhood. This was my first generation of Pokemon games, and through doing this, I'm gaining an understanding for how the games work that child me could only dream of. And if I knew everything that we were doing today was possible as a child, maybe I wouldn't have used the action replay as much as I did back then. But let's wrap up this tangent with the shiny Kyogre that I got after four more resets. And that gets us all of the box legendaries of Gen 3. But Gen 3 continues the legendary legendary trio trend of the first two generations, giving us the Regis here on the side as well, which we have to unlock with Wailord, Relicanth, and a Pokemon that knows Dig. And I figured, why not try to get these guys shiny too? And it's here that you're going to be reminded that RNG manipulation really isn't that easy of a process, as I would spend about an hour getting this Sand Shrew, and about three hours trying to get a shiny Wilmer before giving up on it. For Wilmer though, I was around all these NPCs, which can advance the RNG, so I really should have just gone somewhere else. I just figured it wasn't worth spending a bunch more time on this, and then a bunch of time on Relicanth too. And not all of these guys would be on my first shiny frame anyway, so I would have to wait even longer. I would unlock the Regis, do the things, and set up for more manipulations. And I actually had a little bit of trouble with all of the Regis, taking between 10 to 15 resets for each one. But again, 1 60th of a second looks like this. And in reality, you actually have two frame-perfect inputs to hit. Once to reset the game, and another to start the battle. Some people will have a bit of a negative view on these RNG manipulated shinies, but honestly, at the point we're at in the Pokemon franchise with Legend Arceus and Scarlet and Violet, getting shiny Pokemon in those games is even easier than this. So why is there a stigma at this point? The only main difference here is that Game Freak keeps shiny locking the legendary Pokemon in the newer games. To which we ask, why? For the love of God, it's not going to get me to play Pokemon Go and spend money on those freaking raid passes. I couldn't even play right now if I wanted to, because at the time of writing, it's negative 11 Celsius outside. And for script editor me, it was negative 18 Celsius outside. And just think of how many extra hours people can get from these games because of shiny hunting. Hell, it's one of the only reasons that Sword and Shield are still relevant, because they made a fun way to shiny hunt legendaries. But this time, they just said, here you go, legendaries either without realizing we would want to shiny hunt them, or saying, fuck you, go touch grass, play Pokemon Go, spend money. I like money. To this point, everything's been rather normal. Aside from the RNG manipulation part, many of you have probably done all of this in your Generation 3 games. And here's where things are going to get a little bit weird. There are four legendaries left, Latios, Latias, Deoxys, and Jirachi. And if we want the most legit Mew possible, then five left. And if you want Ho-Oh and Lugia, then you'd have seven left, but I have those from Gen 2. Latias or Latios is already roaming around the region, and because I'm playing in Japanese, I didn't even know which one it was. But frankly, I was scared of RNG manipulating this one, so we're not even going to catch it. Then how am I going to get them, or any of these other legendaries? It's time to introduce my friend, the Big Black Question Mark. Big Black Question you might be familiar with the Palm Egg Berry glitch. One of the big glitches of Gen 3, there's an awful lot of glitches and corruptions you can do with it. This glitch has been known about for many, many years, but only recently did it evolve into something much bigger, as it was found that one of the many glitches and corruptions it can create becomes the pathway to arbitrary code execution. If you'd like a tutorial on this, I'd highly recommend this video by Papa Hefe. He goes over all of the version differences as the language you play on highly affects the process. 
And sadly, if you're playing in Japanese, you might actually want to do this twice, because some of the codes are only available in one execution format, while the other execution format works for most codes, but the codes are significantly shorter. And typing in Japanese when you don't know it kind of really sucks. After I've done everything for this video now, I'm actually kind of good at it, but you know, it's still, it's still kind of a pain. But after we follow Hefei's guide, we have a glitched Pokemon, and simply checking its summary causes the names of the boxes to be read and executed as code, with which we can do basically anything we want, even spawning any shiny Pokemon directly into our box. But it's not that simple, of course. While this may have worked in Gen 2, as of Generation 3, there's a lot more data that gets stored by Pokemon. And if any of this data is particularly suspect, it might ruin our transferring process. So to be on the safe side, we're going to limit the shenanigans we're going to pull with the code. But there's nothing stopping us from giving ourselves the Eon ticket, seeing as we need this to be able to catch both Lotties anyway. The code for which we can find in a paste bin by Slipnare17. According to his Twitter, he's an average glitch enjoyer. And considering he's compiled a list of over 90 different codes to execute and made them available in every language version of the game, I think I'll believe him. Show him some love as well, as the rest of this video wouldn't exist without him. I'm going to be using a lot of these codes throughout the rest of the video, and hopefully Editor Me will help you in finding them easier. Before I would get that shiny though, I was going to need a catching Pokemon, because Klutz only has False Swipe, and who better to get than Smeargle? But access to Smeargle is blocked by Pseudo Wudo, and seeing as this is the only one one we can get, so why not make it shiny? And you know, of course, why not make the Smeargle shiny? And if I'm gonna need a Shroomish to teach its Spore, why not make that shiny as well? And if I want Thunder Wave, I'll need an Electra- you get the point. Don't get lost here though, because I wanted all of these shiny, it took about 9-ish hours to get all of those and teach Smeargle all the right moves. And then 45 minutes later, I'd find a shiny Latios and get spoiled with catching it on the sixth Premier Ball. Like, yeah, I might have 86 Master Balls sitting right there, but the Premier Ball is so much nicer. Now that we have Latios, how am I going to get Latios? After all, I told you that I wasn't going to catch this one. As I said though, we can do basically anything with our abomination here, including respawning the Southern Island Pokemon and switching which one is there. And I'm going to reiterate that trying to type in Japanese when you don't know Japanese really sucks, especially when the symbols look like this, because we're on a Game Boy. Some of the symbols can be straightforward, but others might look exactly like another one, and you might get confused by a capital symbol versus a lowercase symbol. How many of you knew that there was both a capital and a lowercase smiley face in Japanese. The difference matters here. How many of you even knew there were a couple different accent marks that you can put on a symbol? I didn't know that. If for some reason you're following along at home though, and you're also playing in Japanese, I have some advice for you. If you're stuck on a symbol, take a look at the raw hex code of where you're at. Then you can use this chart found on Bulbapedia to determine what that symbol should be. And if you still can't really tell, the nearby symbols on the chart should be the same as the nearby symbols on the game's keyboard. And sometimes those nearby symbols are easier to confirm than saying, I think it's this one. Don't be stupid, like past me. I spent about an hour troubleshooting the codes before I was able to start resetting for Latias. When I would finally hit the shiny frame, Latias then took another half hour to catch. You can, of course, use RNG manipulation to make any Pokeball a Master Ball, but I have no concept of how to do that. With that done, we've only got a few Pokemon left. Just like we unlocked the Eon ticket, we can unlock Birth Island, home of Deoxys. Several of the codes will use this old guy in Mauville City as the mystery gift distributor, and he can be a different color based on your trainer ID. We get the ticket from him and head to the island. I got kind of annoyed with the stone minigame, not gonna lie. But at least it was made up for by the banger boss music Deoxys has. And of course, since we have the Deoxys and Lottie event through this method, we can also acquire an old sea map to be able to catch Mew in the same manner. I'd have a bit of difficulty with the RNG made up for by having the first Premier Ball catch it. This is the face of a man who just got away with murder. I'm, I'm just kidding, FBI. Please don't knock on my door. You can also do the Naval Rock event for Ho-Oh and Lugia, but again, I already have those from Gen 2. Getting all these shiny legendaries was some cute little studying and all, but now it's time for the final exam. Jirachi. Wait, why is there that much time left in the video? Surely it can't be that complicated, right?
While I did have to play in Japanese because the Gen 1 Mew technically didn't count, it made Jirachi a lot more complicated. Jirachi doesn't have an in-game event, and had to be obtained through an event distribution of some sort. And of course, Shiny Jirachi is even more limited, and there are only two confirmed ways to have been able to get a Shiny Jirachi before 2014, the Wishmaker and Channel Jirachi distributions, neither of which I have, and neither of which even work for Emerald, only Ruby and Sapphire. That alone wouldn't have necessarily been an issue, but I'm also on a Japanese copy, and a Japanese game's got Celebi, not Jirachi. So I'm just thinking, am I screwed on this one? I reached out to Sleipnir in his DMs, asking if he had any sort of suggestion as to how to go about this. Japan got quite a few events for Jirachi, but the amount of information for these events is rather limited, because for these events you would have had to have been right there, talking to whoever has the ability to hand out these event Pokemon. In addition to this, you may have had to have been chosen to receive it beforehand, further limiting the pool of people who would have participated in these events. Which makes some of these events so niche, so unknown about, that PK Hex doesn't even have the events registered. This is why I downloaded PK Hex. I wanted to see if it would flag a shiny Jirachi from one of these events as being illegal. Come to find that the majority of GBA Jirachi events aren't even in their database. Though I would still find someone upload one of the unlisted events to Project Pokemon forums. And with this, our glimpse into PK Hex was at the very least still useful. As I was playing around with Jirachis, sometimes hitting that make shiny button, I would notice something. Sometimes it would still have the green check mark until I clicked it, which would then give me an error message, even on the ones we know can be shiny. But PK Hex has been regarded as having better hack checks than the Pokemon Company themselves, and I figured if even it could be fooled for a few seconds, we might be in business. So I set my sights on one particular event Pokemon the 2005 Tanabata Jirachi. This was a Daisuke Club distribution, which was the most common of these Gen 3 Jirachi events. According to Bulbapedia, only about 27,000 people were selected to receive this Jirachi, and quite possibly far fewer actually received it. If you happened to get this event distribution, or might have contact with someone who did, I would love to know the details of how this thing was received. And if you know a person who worked for the distribution, even better, maybe we could reinvent exactly how this event went went down to know if what I'm about to do was even possible. Because of course, I just so happened to have a shiny Jirachi from this event back in 2005, when I was 8 years old. I definitely had the extra money back then to be able to fly to Japan just for a Pokemon event. Don't believe me? Well, too bad. Here it is. See, the ID number matches up, and the OT is correct, and even that pesky secret ID is correct as well. Of course, you probably want to know how I got this. You're probably going to want to get a catching smircle for this one, by the way. If you're following along at home on an English copy, I'll also explain how you can repeat my steps for a shiny Wishmaker Jirachi or a Channel Jirachi instead. No bonus disc required. Wait. Why'd you buy that? We don't need that. Well, that was an expensive backup plan. But the reason I call the Jirachi the final exam is we're gonna have to do a lot of work to make this Jirachi legit, or at least believable enough for me to risk my Pokemon Home and Nintendo Online accounts on it. From the PK3 file of the event I found, we can see that the secret ID of the event is 0000, which they used for many events in Gen 3, by the way. With this, we know both the trainer ID and secret ID that we need. And what do you know? We we can change those with our glitch Pokemon. So I changed my trainer ID to 50707, then the secret ID to 0. If you're doing Wishmaker Jirachi, the TID is 20043 and the SID is also 0. And for Channel Jirachi, the TID is 40122. Since you can't immediately confirm the SID, we have some extra work to do there. After typing in the code to change your SID, save your game. Check the summary of the glitch Pokemon to execute the code, and make sure you do not save from here on out. Next, you're going to want to catch any Pokemon, and then we're going to need another code to read the SID from that caught Pokemon, which will then display as our trainer ID in our trainer card. Whether it ends up being the correct number or not, we are going to reset the game. When you boot back up, if it was the correct number, then you can execute the code again and you're good. But if it wasn't, make sure your code is correct and try that process again. This concludes the first question on the final exam. The exam isn't over yet, but it's time for an extra credit question. Because depending on your character's gender, we might have an extra step here. We don't necessarily have to do this step right now, but you can do it if you want, because you might find it kind of funny. And if you're on Japanese, you might want to do it now, because 
because it's it's easier. If you want to make channel jirachi, you're in luck, because this can have a male or female OT. But the Japanese Tanabata jirachi has to have a female OT, and the Wishmaker jirachi has to have a male OT. And my character on this save file is a male and it needs to be a female, so it's time for a sex change. If only it were this easy and flawless to do in real life. The next closest logical step to a sex change is changing your name. We do another code for that, and it will conveniently be whatever name you type in box 5 for all languages. For channel jirachi, it's just channel, all caps. For wishmaker jirachi, we do wish mkr, again, all caps. And for the Japanese tanabata jirachi, we do whatever this is editor me. Make sure this is easy for people to see what to type. So now we are technically the exact original trainer for these events. But we still have one problem. How the heck do we get a Jirachi? Well, we're gonna need to run several more codes. Since we're literally a god of this world at this point, we're gonna force Jirachi to spawn in a wild battle. And just a flex, we're gonna do it on Mirage Island. So we need the code to make that appear. And what we're gonna do is create a custom mass outbreak on Mirage Island. This is where I'm actually happy that it's Japanese, because the glossary of what to name the boxes looks like this instead of this. You should probably just use the eShark code generator for this one, though. Once again, you're going to want to use the hex code and the character charts from Bulbapedia to make sure you're putting in everything correctly. What we're doing here with this glossary is just converting Jirachi's index number to the code that will make Jirachi appear. Jirachi has an index number of 0199. We run the code and... Oh... Uh, that's a mylotic. For some reason, this character has two separate index numbers. There is literally no difference between them, aside from it being on the red page or the blue page. And this specific circumstance is the only reason that I can see that being an issue. Like, it doesn't matter what button for space you use, why not this one? But after fixing this error, I would have Jirachi on Mirage Island. And now we just need to make it shiny. If you want this to be as legit as possible, you could check Pokefinder to see if there's any way to produce a valid PID confirmed confirmed from the channel and wishmaker distributions, but I'm thinking as long as your trainer ID and secret ID are correct and the PID the Pokemon has says it should be shiny, then I think you're okay. If it does exist for those, even if it's like 4 billion frames out or something, Papa Hefe describes the process of using Ace to adjust your RNG states to make resetting for that shiny frame faster. You might want to go that extra mile, especially if you plan on using this in any sort of online endeavors. But again, you should be fine. The one I'm doing here, we don't even know if it exists so uh, you should be good. From here, we just have to do some wild Pokemon RNG manipulation for a shiny. Seeing as we changed our TID and SID, we're going to have different shiny frames now, saving me a whole 10,000 frames per reset. I'm not sure what the English ones look like, but these shiny frames were pretty good for me. An important thing to note is that the Pokemon here will be level 0, and have four sketches as its move set. I just had it copy my Smeargle's moves, False Swipe, and Odor Sleuth have a lot of PP. It also copied Spore though, so I got a taste of my own medicine. And the reason you want a Catching Smeargle for this is it will have to be in a regular Pokeball. You technically don't have to catch it with one, we can change it if you don't, but I'd advise suffering through it anyway, especially if you're on Japanese. Because the code to change that stuff is only in the other execution method, and I really didn't want to have to get another glitch Pokemon. If the stars align and that three catch rate doesn't make you want to pull all of your hairs out one by one, you'll have a shiny Jirachi in a Pokeball. But we're still not completely done. You'll have to level it up to get rid of all of its moves, because if they aren't something Jirachi can learn, they are illegal. Nothing a little Battle Tower rare candy cloning can't fix. And now, at this point, it should be fine to transfer. For Japanese, the one incorrect thing about it is the met location being Route 130, instead of a fateful encounter. If you're doing Channel or Wishmaker, then additionally, the original game of the Pokemon is incorrectly Emerald when it should be Ruby or Sapphire. And if you didn't use a Pokeball when catching it, you'll also want to change that. The level met should actually be correct at level 5, because level 0 is what is used for eggs, and in this game they hatch at level 5. Some of its data will be erased when transferring to the newer games, but I'm not exactly sure to what extent the metadata survives. So if you want to be extra extra safe and go that extra mile, you'll need one final code, where we can conveniently change all of this info at the same time. And you can also give it Pokerus while you're at it. An important thing for Japanese players to note though is that it's only available in the 0615 execution method. They will not work for the 085F method, and that's why I was completely clueless as to why these weren't working. And again, I didn't want to bother getting the other 
other glitch Pokemon. It wasn't even available at all in Japanese, but shout out Slipenir, he was able to have it available in a couple days. For me though, I just ended up seeing if it would work as is, with Route 130 as the met location, transferring a copy of each of our shinies and shiny legendaries. And while I was at it, I cloned a few Pokemon from my original Emerald file to bring up. And I don't remember this at all, but somehow I had a Wishmaker Jirachi on Emerald. I'm not sure if it was from a Game Shark or an Action Replay code, or if I actually had it traded to me by someone. Maybe I should ask my childhood friend Jimmy if he had the bonus disc back in the day, but I would transfer from Gen 3 to Gen 4, from Gen 4 to Gen 5, from Gen 5 to Pokemon Bank, from Pokemon Bank to Pokemon Home, and Pokemon Home to Pokemon Scarlet. And with the new DLC, the only Pokemon we couldn't bring up were Talo and Electrike. So it's not a real Borb after all. I noticed we had some ribbons on some of these guys, and I have to applaud Game Freak on the title name here. My childhood Blaziken is definitely a treasured memory. And with the power of cloning, I can enjoy these Pokemon in both Gen 3 and Gen 9 forever. Thank you guys for watching, and... Wait, what's that? The video's not over? What more could I possibly do? Well, when I said I wouldn't be going for perfect IVs on Pokemon in this video, that was originally the plan. But when I was done with the script, it was later in the day around 7pm, and I was just going to start recording in the morning. However, I decided to learn the process of going for particular IVs on the Pokemon with the rest of the day. And I can't exactly explain it, but I couldn't stop. I became low-key addicted to RNG manipulating the best Pokemon of Gen 3. I started with 5 IV, 0 attack Pokemon, moving on to 6 IV, and then to 0 speed. But how does this differ from what I've already done? Well, the main thing is it's a bit of a pain in the ass to set up. You have to look up the Pokemon that you want, you figure out what SID could make that Pokemon shiny, you change your SID, meaning you have to solve this garbage again, then you have to check your SID, so you catch a Pokemon, run a code to confirm the new SID, find a nearby seed to that shiny frame that you can reach, and then use the eShark generator to make a code so that way you can hit a closer seed to the target Pokemon. And if you happen to have caught all the static Pokemon and are looking for those, then you're going to have to use some codes to get them to respawn. Don't worry about using that for the explanation, by the way. Papa Hefe does this at the end of his video. But it's just a whole lot of setup work involved. But again, I couldn't stop myself from doing all of this. I did all that setup work four times. I got a perfect minus attack quirky nature setup that I used for Latias, Latios, Rayquaza, because why not, Regice, Mew, Kyogre, Cyndaquil, and Trico. Then I set up for a full 6 IV docile shiny frame, getting Beldum, Mew, Ho-Oh, and Lugia, all the Gen 2 starters, all the Gen 3 starters, and the Gen 3 legendaries with those stats. The only exceptions being Jirachi and Deoxys. Jirachi, because as we went over, it would be illegal, you have to do the right TID and SID combo, and I'm pretty sure none of these combinations can be perfect IVs. And Deoxys, only because the code to respawn it isn't translated for Japanese versions just yet, but slightly said he just kind of takes requests for what gets converted to Japanese, so that code might be available by the time this video goes up, but I already got the shiny one, so I didn't really need another one. But I got all of those, and I realized, wait, Regirock, Regice, and Registeel are all really slow, so it would probably be worth getting a zero speed version of those guys. And Regice again would want zero attack, so I repeated the whole process over again just for one singular Pokemon being this zero attack, zero speed Regice. And I did it one last time for a zero speed Regirock and Registeel, meaning I now had an entire box of perfect shiny Pokemon to transfer, plus an extra clone of my Shroomish from earlier, just so I can make it to 30 for that Gen 4 transfer step. But all of this still wasn't good enough for me. When I did the first transfers, I noticed the treasured memory and the Hoenn Champion ribbons, and are these Pokemon really perfect if they don't have a single ribbon from Gen 3? So I took all of them through the Elite for having a Rayquaza carry them so they wouldn't gain experience or anything so I could train them properly in Scarlet and Violet. I didn't record most of this because I was having a bit of a nostalgia trip with this part. I used to bring my OG Rayquaza through the Hoenn Elite 4 time and time again on this very Game Boy. So to do it now with a shiny Rayquaza, it a little bit different. So I would make all of these Pokemon champions, and then I would have to trade them over to my English save file. And I actually had to buy another GBA and a link cable to do this, because for some reason you can't use the PAL Park with a different language GBA game. But I plugged in my heart gold version and started to transfer- Oh, oh no, what are you doing? 
Why are you going into the contest hall? So yeah, apparently even this wasn't enough for my liking. I also had to get a contest ribbon on every single one of these Pokemon, just so they could have the treasured memory title. I think past me is stalling on this video being over at this point. What, the 70-ish hours of getting all these guys wasn't enough, huh? You just had to spend another 11 hours in the contest hall? Well, yeah, just entering the contest wasn't enough. You'd need to feed them Pokeblocks to give them good initial assessment. Then you you're at the mercy of the contest hall AI who are actually pretty darn good at trying to make sure that you specifically don't win, even on the easiest rank. Even if that means giving another one of the AIs a double maximum audience. And not to mention, this is my childhood save file that had basically no berry variety and I only had one or two left of all these berries. Thankfully the battle tower dupe is pretty busted, but then of course I had to turn all these berries into pokeblocks and to consistently win most of the contests on the first try I had to feed them five pokeblocks each. So yeah, it took about 11 hours. But I mean, come on, the title is cool. And I would finally do the whole transfer journey again basking in the sparkles of my perfect 3D shiny Pokemon from Gen 3. I should probably train some of these guys for raids now, huh? But thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, be sure to like the video. And once again, if you haven't already, check out I'm a Blissey, Papa Hefe, and Slipenir17. Their links are down below. Go sub to all these guys. And make sure to subscribe here. I do normal shiny hunting videos as well, and I'll probably be doing a very similar video to this for Generation 4. Thank you to Twinkle for becoming a new channel member and directly supporting my content. You can do so here with memberships or super thanks or via Patreon or my Twitch channel if you want to catch some videos live. I will be making some bonus videos with this footage that will be available to members and patrons. And that extra support is greatly appreciated. A lot goes back into the channel. Again, I had to buy an additional GBA and Link cable for this video, and, you know, I, I bought a Colosseum bonus disc as a backup plan for Jirachi, so, uh, this video was expensive. Don't worry, the box part of it was fake, so I saved about $40 on that, but the disc part was still pretty expensive. Hopefully the next video is not too much more expensive. <laughs> oh, uh, I bought some new Gen 4 and Gen 5 games already. Looks like we're going to Sinnoh and Unova.